This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tremendous Trifles by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 32 The Travellers in State The other day, to my great astonishment, I caught a train. It was a train going into the eastern counties, and I only just caught it. And while I was running along the train, amid general admiration, I noticed that there were a quite peculiar and unusual number of carriages marked engaged. On five, six, seven, eight, nine carriages was pasted the little notice at five, six, seven, eight, nine windows were big bland men staring out in the conscious pride of possession. Their bodies seemed more than usually impenetrable, their faces more than usually placid. It could not be the Derby, if for only the minor reasons that it was the opposite direction and the wrong day. It could hardly be the King, it could hardly be the French President, for though these distinguished persons naturally like to be private for three hours, they are at least public for three minutes. A crowd can gather to see them step into the train, and there was no crowd here, or any police ceremonial. Who were those awful persons who occupied more of the train than a bricklayer's bean-feast, and yet were more fastidious and delicate than the king's own suite? Who were these that were larger than a mob, yet more mysterious than a monarch? Was it possible that instead of our royal house visiting the Tsar, he was really visiting us? Or does the House of Lords have a breakfast? I waited and wondered until the train slowed down at some station in the direction of Cambridge. Then the large, impenetrable men got out, and after them got out the distinguished holders of the engaged seats. They were all dressed decorously in one color. They had neatly cropped hair, and they were chained together. I looked across the carriage at its only other occupant, and our eyes met. He was a small, tired-looking man, and, as I afterwards learnt, a native of Cambridge. By the look of him, some working tradesman there, such as a journeyman, tailor, or a small clock-mender. In order to make conversation, I said, I wondered where the convicts were going. His mouth twitched with the instinctive irony of our poor, and he said, I don't suppose they're going on an holiday at the seaside with the little spades and pails. I was naturally delighted, and pursuing the same vein of literary invention, I suggested that perhaps dons were taken down to Cambridge chained together like this and as he lived in Cambridge and had seen several dons, he was pleased with such a scheme. Then, when we had ceased to laugh, we suddenly became quite silent, and the bleak grey eyes of the little man grew sadder and emptier than an open sea. I knew what he was thinking, because I was thinking the same, because all modern sophists are only sophists, and there is such a thing as mankind. Then at last and it fell in as exactly as the right last note of a tune one is trying to remember, he said, Well, I suppose we have to do it. And in those three things, his first speech and his silence and his second speech, there were all the three great fundamental facts of the English democracy. Its profound sense of humor, its profound sense of pathos, and its profound sense of helplessness. It cannot be too often repeated that all real democracy is an attempt, like that of a jolly hostess, to bring the shy people out. For every practical purpose of a political state, for every practical purpose of a tea party, he that abaseth himself must be exalted. At a tea party it is equally obvious that he that exalteth himself must be abased, if possible without bodily violence. Now, people talk of democracy as being coarse and turbulent. It is a self-evident error in mere history. Aristocracy is the thing that is always coarse and turbulent, for it means appealing to the self-confident people. Democracy means appealing to the different people. Democracy means getting those people to vote who would never have the cheek to govern, and according to Christian ethics, the precise people who ought to govern are the people who have not the cheek to do it. There is a strong example of this truth in my friend in the train. 
the only two types we hear of in this argument about crime and punishment are two very rare and abnormal types we hear of the stark sentimentalist who talks as if there were no problem at all as if physical kindness would cure everything as if one needed only pat nero and stroke ivan the terrible this mere belief in bodily humanitarianism is not sentimental it is simply snobbish for if comfort gives men virtue the comfortable classes ought to be virtuous which is absurd then again we do hear of the yet weaker and more watery type of sentimentalist i mean the sentimentalist who says with a sort of splutter flog the brutes or who tells you with an innocent obscenity what he would do with a certain man always supposing the man's hands were tied this is the more effeminate type of the two but both are weak and unbalanced and it is only these two types the sentimental humanitarian and the sentimental brutalitarian whom one hears in the modern babel yet you very rarely meet either of them in a train you never meet anyone else in a controversy the man you meet in a train is like this man that i met he is emotionally decent only he is intellectually doubtful so far from luxuriating in the loathsome things that could be done to criminals he feels bitterly how much better it would be if nothing need be done but something must be done i suppose we have to do it in short he is simply a sane man and of a sane man there is only one safe definition he is a man who can have tragedy in his heart and comedy in his head now the real difficulty of discussing decently this problem of the proper treatment of criminals is that both parties discuss the matter without any direct human feeling the denouncers of wrong are as cold as the organizers of wrong humanitarianism is as hard as inhumanity let me take one practical instance i think the flogging arranged in our modern prisons is a filthy torture all its scientific paraphernalia the photographing the medical attendance prove that it goes on to the last foul limit of the boot and rack the cat is simply the rack without any of its intellectual reasons holding this view strongly i open the ordinary humanitarian books or papers and i find a phrase like this the lash is a relic of barbarism so is the plough so is the fishing net so is the horn or the staff or the fire lit in winter what an inexpressibly feeble phrase for anything one wants to attack a relic of barbarism it is as if a man walked naked down the street tomorrow and we said that his clothes were not quite in the latest fashion there's nothing particularly nasty about being a relic of barbarism man is a relic of barbarism civilization is a relic of barbarism but torture is not a relic of barbarism at all in actuality it is simply a relic of sin but in comparative history it may well be called a relic of civilization it has always been most artistic and elaborate when everything else was most artistic and elaborate thus it was detailed exquisite in the late roman empire in the complex and gorgeous sixteenth century in the centralized french monarchy a hundred years before the revolution and in the great chinese civilization to this day this is first and last the frightful thing we must remember in so far as we grow instructed and refined we are not in any sense whatever naturally moving away from torture we may be moving toward torture we must know what we are doing if we are to avoid the enormous secret cruelty which has crowned every historic civilization the train moves more swiftly through the sunny english fields they have taken the prisoners away, and I do not know what they have done with them. The end of chapter 32